Hi and welcome to my talk for the International Conference on Men's Issues 2020. This talk is going to be called Making Sense of the Red Pill Experience. So you join me here today at this beauty spot in the heart of England and as you can see behind me there is a waterway. It is in fact a canal, an artificial waterway that was constructed in the 18th century during the Industrial Revolution here in the United Kingdom and it was originally used to carry coal and various other goods. Today the canal is full of narrowboats operated by people who travel up and down purely for pleasure. So it is quite a nice atmosphere here amongst all of this greenery and so a good place I think to reflect and to share my thoughts with you. Now I would say that this talk has been a long while in the making. I am not normally someone who is in the habit of writing talks and making videos, let alone videos that are to do with politics. But I've wanted to find some way to express myself and how I feel about things for quite some time, at least for the last three to four years, as I've seen, like many others have seen, the significant changes that have been going on in our politics and culture. So why have I titled this talk, Making Sense of the Red Pill Experience? Well, the simple reason for that is because it describes my own journey through trying to understand and get my head around these issues. And this comes at a time in our Western culture when trying to make sense of anything has arguably become more difficult. There is this idea, which I've seen expressed by Brett Weinstein, for example, that there has been an attack on the very business of sense making itself. That the trusted sources we once held very dear to us, such as the broadcast media and the education system, can no longer be completely trusted to offer people a balanced and heterodox perspective. To allow a democracy to function properly, in my opinion, people should be presented with the facts so that they can make up their own minds, but what falls in the domain of political opinion should be clearly signposted as being separate from this. However, there is the feeling that this is not what has been happening and that fact and political opinion are now rather blurred. So how did I become interested in these gender issues? Well, it all started about six years ago. I decided to switch off the television for a change and do something else with my free time because I had started to find the TV increasingly less satisfying to watch. I had originally been looking for content online discussing religion and atheism. But one day I came across an advertising campaign called Violence is Violence that was put out by the Mankind Initiative, a domestic violence charity here in the UK that helps male victims. Now this ad campaign demonstrated perfectly well a situation that you may be familiar with where two actors, a man and a woman, are on a public street having an argument and getting physical. When the man abuses the woman, lots of people quite rightly come to the woman's aid and tells the man to back off. But when the genders are reversed and it's the man who is under attack from the woman, absolutely no one cares. And not just that, they find it amusing as well. Now roughly around the same time I also came across a video that showed a group of protesters including a very obnoxious woman with red hair protesting a men's issues event in Toronto. There also had been the protest against the author Warren Farrell at the University of Toronto. Now what struck me when watching the footage of these protests was how unbelievably angry these women were all I could see were people in the men's issues meeting having a calm and orderly discussion as should be their right in a free society and I honestly couldn't understand where the anger was actually coming from. So I decided I'd like to find out. Now this led me to doing more research and eventually I found some podcasts featuring Erin Pitsy, Warren Farrell and others and I also found the now legendary content put out by Man Woman Myth and Karen Strawn. Now at the time there was a relatively limited amount of content on YouTube and other sources that were discussing these issues. 
but I think it's fair to say that what I learnt did, to some extent, shock me. You know, sometimes it's only when you actually listen to real people on the front line, rather than some friendly sanitised version that you might see elsewhere, do you really get an understanding of what the actual set of ideas are that have been driving these activists for many years? For me, getting clarification about what the ideas were, I think, was key to me making sense of things. And the kind of things I was hearing, seeing and reading about, such as what happened to Erin Pitsy and the hijacking of her refuge movement, were not anything that I'd ever seen on our mainstream media before. Now at that point, I probably could have just left it there and got on with my life. But then a few things happened. Firstly, my father sadly passed away around that time. And I guess on some level that influenced me to think about his role in my life and what role fathers have in their sons' lives more generally. And secondly, I think that I had to learn more because I knew that a former girlfriend of mine had been interested in these ideas and had studied them as part of her degree in psychology. It's my view that it was those ideas that had had a toxic, poisonous effect on her and is what quite possibly helped to bring our relationship to an end. And so I think there was a feeling that to make myself prepared for more successful relationships in the future, that I had to understand these gender issues more deeply. So in order to gather my own perspective, I decided to engage directly by going to meet people. You know, it's one thing just sitting at a computer, but it's another to actually go out and see what other people are thinking and to have proper conversations. As part of this process, I attended in person the International Conference on Men's Issues in London, the annual Battle of Ideas events at the Barbican, and an event that was put on by the Men and Boys Coalition. There were also other events that came from a different perspective, such as the Being a Man Festival on the South Bank, and even an event that was staged by the Women's Equality Party. And along the way, I think it's fair to say that I've met some really interesting people and made a few like-minded friends. So perhaps it's time to talk about the red pill. So what is the red pill as far as I'm concerned? Well, I'm sure if you're watching this video, you're probably already aware of the origin of the term in the film, The Matrix. And you may also have seen the Cassie J movie of the same name that was released in 2016. Both films come recommended from me, by the way. Now, I suppose the red pill can mean slightly different things to different people. But when it comes to these kinds of gender issues, I think it can be divided into broadly two categories. Number one is understanding interpersonal relationships between men and women, particularly as they pertain to dating and marriage. And secondly, is understanding the overall landscape of gender politics at a societal and cultural level. Now, in both cases, I think taking the red pill is the idea that, at the very least, you're being exposed to a different point of view that might make you question your assumptions. Or it's also possible that when you hear these views, actually, you feel it's always been the truth, it's just that you didn't have the words to express it before. And what certainly can make it frustrating is that it's the kind of information that no one else has ever really told you. Not your parents, not your teachers, not the BBC, not anyone. Now both of these categories are sort of separate to each other, but also very interrelated. Because what is happening at a wider cultural level, inevitably, is going to have an impact on how we interact as men and women at an individual level. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. Now, I've avoided mentioning it by name so far, but let's be honest and say that it's impossible to talk about anything relating to gender politics without mentioning the F word. The set of ideas behind the feminist movement have dominated the discourse around gender equality for decades. Now, if you were to believe some people, feminism is a very noble and 
well-meaning social movement that believes in women's rights and gender equality. And the dictionary definition of the term looks innocent enough. It's also very hard to argue with women's rights. I mean, that sounds like a good thing. Gender equality, again, sounds like a good thing because the word equality implies fairness and equal treatment. But if you dig deeper, you find that it's way more than this. To me, feminism has to be taken primarily as a political movement, and that is because its devotees are very active in the political system. On the political spectrum, you have ideologies like liberalism, conservatism or socialism. Each of those ideologies has a way of looking at the world we live in, about how it works, and from this, they produce a manifesto of how they want to change it. What became clear to me is that feminism is just another one of those ideologies. It often pretends to be the received truth, but in reality it exists in the marketplace of ideas and should not be beyond criticism like any other political viewpoint. Now, I personally have never identified as a feminist even before becoming the more politically aware person that I am today. In fact, I think I always considered the F word to be associated with something relatively extreme, although I wasn't sure exactly what. And although I certainly do care about everyday fairness in our society, and I want everyone to have equal opportunities without being discriminated against, I did feel that feminism wasn't for me, perhaps just for the simple reason that the name implied that these were women's issues that only interested women. And the thing is, most objective people would look at the culture today and see that it was self-evident that women are doing extremely well, and that's a good thing. I'm someone who believes in a healthy democracy, with votes for everyone and equal pay. But both of those goals have already been achieved here in the United Kingdom, roughly 100 years ago and 50 years ago, respectively. There are even things that I think feminism was right about. I think they were correct to point out that we're at a place in our civilization where we can have a conversation about gender roles and maybe think about moving on from the roles that we fulfilled for such a long time and make them a bit more flexible. And this movement, with the power of women behind it, actually had an incredible opportunity. They had the opportunity to create a genuinely inclusive social movement, a movement that, that could include both men and women could create a positive vision for men and women and to honour the contribution of both the men and the women of the past and work together in such a way that respected relationships and the importance of children and families. But of course, that isn't what we got, was it? Before I went on this journey, I honestly felt, perhaps in my naivete, that the feminist movement was largely irrelevant these days, that their goals had already been met and that these were people who didn't have that much power or influence. But it seems I was wrong. One of the things I realised along the way is that this ideology has a lot more power than you might think. Decades of activism and fundraising now mean that many of the radicals of yesterday are now the same people who are still using that same ideological lens to make political decisions today. These are people who somehow managed to pull off the trick of having institutional power while simultaneously claiming that they are still oppressed. Now that would not be a problem if I believed that institutional feminism across the Western world was exercising its power responsibly. But I find that hard to believe when an organization like the United Nations recently sent out a tweet saying that, quote, the COVID-19 pandemic is demonstrating what we all know. Millennia of patriarchy have resulted in a male-dominated world with a male-dominated culture, which damages everyone, unquote. You know, this is a pandemic that has killed more men than women across the entire age range and how exactly they justify such an insensitive and negative statement like that towards men is, is beyond me. I think that as a concerned member of the public, 
any feminist organization or any organization that has feminist influence, and particularly any that is receiving public money, needs to be held accountable. So where did it all go wrong? Well, from what I've gathered is that individual feminists exist on a spectrum, from the relatively reasonable, like Christina Hoff Summers, to those who are more eccentric and fiercely opinionated, like Camille Pallio. And they also go from the sorts of young women like Lacey Green, who seem nice enough, all the way to the sorts of radical gender studies professors and social justice warriors who are unhinged. So I certainly don't want to put all of them in the same box, but it seems obvious to me that where it went wrong was the adoption of Marxist ideas. And as the tweet from the United Nations demonstrates, there is also this enduring belief in the idea of what feminists call patriarchy. Now, for a concept like patriarchy that lies at the heart of the feminist belief system, and a concept that also seems to fit into a wider left-wing belief system that looks at all sorts of things as systems of power based upon identity groups, you would think that there'd be a precise definition of the term, but there isn't. However, I suppose if I could define it, is that it would be some sort of system of male dominance of society. And the thing is, I think that this is quite a powerful concept, and I'm quite embarrassed to admit that when I was younger and a little bit more left-leaning, I used to buy into it myself. It's very easy to believe, because most of our politicians and a high proportion of CEOs in big corporations who are making these big decisions about our government and our economy seem mostly to be men. But the problem with it is this. Politicians and CEOs combined only represent a relatively small minority of very successful men in society. It simply doesn't take into account the fact that the vast majority of ordinary men have never been anywhere near a political office and have never been anywhere near a boardroom. A lot of men, just like a lot of women, don't even have the desire to do either of these jobs. After all, being a politician or a CEO can be a very stressful and thankless existence, and it's something that's only suited to a very few. The fact is, the vast majority of ordinary men, like me, are just trying to get by in life, day to day, paying the bills and trying to find some measure of happiness and meaning like everybody else. What you realize is that feminists believe the idea that a relatively small number of successful men at the top of our society is somehow representative of the success of all men everywhere, and that is just not true. It simply isn't a fair analysis of our society. In fact, you will find a lot more men at the very bottom of our society rather than at the top. Just one example being is that 95% of people who are in prison are men. And when it comes to our politicians, who has the power really? Is it the MPs and the government who have the power? Or is it the electorate, 50% men and 50% women, who put them there and who can vote them out? And who has the power? Is it the CEOs of the companies? Or is it the consumers of their goods and services that can vote with their wallets? In fact, according to Catalyst.org, nearly 70% of all UK household consumption is controlled or influenced by women. And in many key household areas, such as buying a home, the influence is far greater than that. So you see, the whole concept of how we define power isn't anywhere near as straightforward as you might think. So, here we are at a more secluded part of this beauty spot so that we can really talk about gender equality. So let's have a further look at some areas of inequality you may have heard about. Here is a chart which I've titled Gendered Imbalances and it shows just a few areas where there are differences in outcomes between men and women. 
On the left, there are outcomes where men are seen to do better or have some sort of upper hand. And on the right, there are some outcomes where women could seem to be better and where women have the upper hand. So let's have a look at the list where men are doing better. So for instance, a common complaint is that there are more male MPs than female MPs and more male CEOs than female CEOs. There is also the complaint that men tend to earn more than women over a lifetime, which is known as the gender pay gap. There are also certain careers where there tend to be a lot more men than women doing them, such as computer science and engineering. And male violence against women is certainly a real issue. So let's look at the list on the right. There are also careers that are dominated by women. Very important careers such as teaching and nursing and increasingly veterinary science, biological and life sciences. Women are also starting to dominate in fields like psychology and making advances in the law profession. Women have more reproductive rights and options for contraception than men do when it comes to family planning. And women do better than men in family court and divorce settlements. Women now make up most university graduates, which is going to give them more access to the professional jobs market. And there is also female violence towards men, which is also a very real issue. Now, I think this is the kind of list that any objective person might come up with. And from looking at this, any normal person might think that society is just in fact a, a complicated mix of advantages and disadvantages for both sexes. But that is not the feminist perspective. To get to that, all you have to do really is ignore all of the inequalities that favour women in any way and then to pretend that all of the inequalities that favour men only exist because women are deliberately being held back or that there is some combination of institutional sexism, misogyny or patriarchal oppression. Now to be fair, the feminist movement doesn't really pretend to be anything other than purely advocacy for women and that's why they ignore these other issues. But does anybody honestly think that patriarchy represents a fair analysis of our whole society? Because I don't. Firstly, it's dishonest and one-sided because it leaves out half of the issues. And it's one-dimensional because in order to explain gender inequality, all you have to do is just think one thing. So if there is male violence against women, it's because of their desire for patriarchal control. If there are more MPs and CEOs than are men, it's because women are being deliberately held back due to institutional male power. And if there are more men doing a particular career, it can only be because of widespread sexism and so on. And how would any system of so-called male dominance, even one that the United Nations says exists, allow any equality that favoured women at all? Why would it do that? Of course, in reality, there is no omnipotent power structure called the patriarchy. This analysis is far too simplistic for the complicated society that we live in. A much more rational and sensible explanation is that these inequalities on both sides are much more likely to be caused by a complicated mix of different reasons. It's a lot more to do with the free choices that men and women freely make in our society. Now, I think it's too bad that a poor theory like this has gained so much credence over the years and it seems to me that things have only become progressively worse with these theories expanding in both their scope and their influence over our culture. These days, feminism now just seems to be an arm of the wider woke movement that is also very preoccupied with race as well. Now, I cannot and will not subscribe to this kind of conspiracy theory. Men and women should be partners who work together to build a better society, but instead, these theories have actually portrayed men and women as class enemies and that men can only be viewed as evil, patriarchal oppressors and women as perpetually oppressed and subjugated victims. In my opinion, this has bred resentment between men and women and has destroyed relationships 
just like it destroyed mine. We are constantly told nowadays that men, in particular white men, are angry. But I think that both men and women are angry. Some women have become angry because they have had their minds poisoned, mistakenly believing that they are systemically oppressed, and in some extreme cases have been radicalised enough to attend and protest the Men's Issues event I mentioned earlier, and doing things like denying men the opportunity to have Men's Issues societies on university campuses where they want to talk about genuine issues affecting vulnerable young men, such as mental health. And it has made men angry because they believe they have been completely ignored, misrepresented and misunderstood by a distorted view of history. You know, if you look at the history in an honest way, you find that both sexes had roles and responsibilities historically, and both sexes took risks. For women, the risks they took were in childbirth, in an era where there was much less reliable birth control and more taboo in using it. So women typically had their children young and considerably more of them. And before modern medicine, complications and disease would more often lead to the risk of death. So women's lives were hard, but so were men's. Think about the navvies, the men who built our entire railway infrastructure, such as the tunnels and the viaducts, in many cases without adequate health and safety precautions that led to a lot of men dying in the process. Think about the men who went down the mines, the miners spending a lifetime underground digging out coal so that we could heat our homes. Think about the men who worked in the shipyards, the shipbuilders who did backbreaking work so that we could sail the seas. Think about the men who built our canals like this one to transport raw materials and goods. And think about the men who walked upon the moon and the engineers who built the computers to send them there. Men historically have done most of the difficult and dangerous occupations outside of the home so that future generations could have a better life. And as Warren Farrell pointed out in his book, The Myth of Male Power, have often felt obligated to take jobs they don't like in order to put a roof over everyone's head and food on the table. Men have done this throughout history and still continue to do it today. And not only that, men have either died or been traumatized in their millions in two world wars in just the last 100 years. So the question I have to ask is this, where is the acknowledgement of any of that from the feminist movement? Where is any kind of gratitude or recognition? Where is the celebration from gender studies professors that men, whilst not necessarily perfect, are actually fundamentally pretty good people? Well, of course, there isn't any. The fundamental problem with feminism is that it's an ideology that is kind of solipsistic. It exists in an ideological echo chamber, and that instead of recognising that everyone, both men and women included, were historically oppressed by poor living conditions which brought with it the constraints of gender roles, they instead decided to blame men for women's oppression instead, and they are still doing it today. There's a continuous desire to look at men and everything that men ever say or do in purely negative terms, and this ranges from those like Susanna Danuta Walters, a gender studies professor who said that women have every right to hate men, to those like Clementine Ford who likes to sign books with the phrase, have you killed any men today? And those like Laura Bates and anyone expressing similar sentiments in the Twitter cesspit. Now this has to change. You know, I celebrate women for the contribution they have made to our civilization but I also celebrate men as well. Protecting and providing for women and children, which is what men like my late father did, does not amount to oppression. It is the very opposite. And for the feminist movement to characterise the complicated, intimate and interdependent relationship between men and women in this way is something that I find deeply hurtful, 
and offensive. In summary, I think it's long overdue for our culture to have a rethink. The way it looks to me is that whilst all of the conversation has been about women's equality for decades, in the same period of time, men and boys have not only been neglected, but actively demonized. And the latest version of this is now to denigrate masculinity by labeling it as toxic or harmful by a supposedly professional organization like the American Psychological Association. My message to the APA and to anyone who thinks like them is that you should be ashamed of yourselves. If we want good men in society, and I have to assume that this is what many feminists themselves want, as a culture, we must work with masculinity and not against it. This means giving boys and men the investment, space and respect to develop themselves as good people. Telling men that they are the oppressors of women, that they have male privilege, or that there's something wrong with their masculinity, and then telling them that the future is female will only ever create resentment and achieve the exact opposite. And I speak today when, according to the Office for National Statistics figures that came out just a few weeks ago, the suicide rate for men in the, in the United Kingdom is now at its highest for 20 years. Now, I don't claim to have the answers for any of this. Sometimes I feel like merely a bystander, but I am now glad that there is a dialogue going on. And I'm very glad to have been part of it for this conference. My long-term hope is that there can be a movement that has a widespread cultural appeal so that more people see the humanity of men, that men matter, and to reject the bitter and resentful gender ideologues. Thanks for watching.